In the following introduction, which will comprise three separate sessions, we will focus on the following essentials. Introduction of the course, its objective and methodology, and an explanation of course expectations. By the end of these three sessions, you'll be able to identify the following. The course topic and overall objective, the nature of the class, particularly as an exercise in project-based learning and case study analysis, the types of assignments you can expect, and some parish virtual time management strategies. Let me draw your attention to three articles that were published just four days apart back in 2013. The first is this. Right here in Texas, a federal judge ordered the American Quarter Horse Association to enter into their official registry cloned American Quarter Horses and their offspring. Now think about that for just a moment. Why would anyone want to clone an American Quarter Horse? You might be thinking of a variety of possible reasons. In this article, Mike Brunker of NBC News draws our attention to the obvious one given the animal's breed, reproducing and champion racehorses. Imagine that, and what the implications this sort of activity might have on the horse racing industry and the world of gambling. Now there's one other thing to consider that might open up a whole new set of queries, and that is what we read in the caption just under the photo here to the left. Cryozootech, the French company that cloned a racehorse, chose a castrated male champion, implying that the rationale was to intervene in the case where the horse couldn't reproduce naturally. In other words, such a procedure was surely a benefit to the owner or owners of the original animal who put in the time and the finances to raise the horse. It's tragic that they can't continue the champion's line, so why not just use technology to do that for us? Let's just clone it. Take a look at this next article. This was published the very next day by ABC News. Scientists breed rabbits with an eerie glow. In this case, scientists actually inserted the genes of jellyfish into the embryos of rabbits. Why? For at least two reasons. First, just to see if gene transfer would be successful, which apparently it was, look how they glow. And secondly, so they could track pollutants, perhaps environmental pollutants of some sort, as they pass through their systems. Eerie? Maybe you agree. Whatever your questions might be, we at least have to ask whether these new creatures and their offspring are still truly rabbits. We're not talking about cloned rabbits here. We're talking about alterations to their very genetic makeup, their DNA. They look like rabbits, certainly, and have the features of rabbits, but what exactly are they now? Jelly rabbits? One last article. Within two days of the rabbit announcement, ABC News published another article about a little girl named Gabby Williams. Gabby is an eight-year-old with a genetic de defect that prohibits her from aging. She's an eight-year-old with the body and, as far as we can tell, mental capacity of an infant. Now take a look at the article headline. Although the aired television program about Gabby focused on her parents' consultation with a genetic specialist to find out whether they carried a certain genetic defect that could potentially resurface if they chose to have other children, the author of the article caught what he sensed would be the real interest of the public, the matter of enabling for immortality if we could just discover the gene that enabled aging, and in our case, perhaps just turn it off. Instead of it being a problem such as Gabby's case, her defect might actually be the key to solving, in our case, the very problem of human aging in general. The point of all this? Today, we're no longer using techniques simply to build better buildings, bridges, and infrastructures, vehicles, better cell phones and computational devices, and other contraptions that make life more efficient for us. We have technologies that enable us to do things only dreamed of in the past. Moreover, those abilities now cause us to have to ask new questions that we've never had to ask before in the historical development of technology. Now, because of what we can and are already doing to the broader world around us, and even to ourselves, we have to ask the question, what effects do the applications of these new technologies have on human relationships? More specifically, how we relate to ourselves as human beings, in other words, how do they reflect or affect our idea of what it means to be human, how we relate to one another as individuals, and how we relate to one another as a community and to the broader world around us. 
these are the types of important queries that makers of new technologies and those who support their production and applications often do not consider, particularly in purview of long-term effects. Here's a factor to keep in mind. We don't have enough time to study those possible effects because developments of new technologies are taking place at an exponential rate. That being the case, is there any way that we can assess these new technologies and their applications? Yes. And this is where religion and technology meet. Religion can offer a helpful perspective and a simple but profound value measuring tool. Welcome to Contemporary Religious Issues, Religion and Technology. To continue on to part two of this introduction, simply select the next video entitled CRI Introduction Part Two.